Okay, uh, welcome to a uh, presentation by Professor Foley. It's a real pleasure to have her back. This is, what, your third? Fourth? Third. Visit to FAU? Yeah, I'm still not a pro. I'm finding my way around, so it's probably like second. Well, I've been here 25 years and I still get lost. Okay, well, now so, uh, Professor Foley is going to give a presentation on the constitutionality of the Iran nuclear deal. This, the funding source for this presentation is the Institute for Humane Studies. The website is available. It's on some of the literature that is uh, in front of you. Let me say, give you a little information about Professor Foley. Professor Elizabeth Price Foley, FIU College of Law, is the author of Liberty for All, Reclaiming Individual Privacy in a New Era of Public Morality, Yale University Press. Another book is The Law of Life and Death, Harvard University Press. In the most recent book, Tea Party, Three Principles, Cambridge University Press. She is a frequent media co commentator and op-ed writer, and her opinions have aired on the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Miami Herald, National Law Journal, National Public Radio, SCOTUSblog.com, Jurist, CNN, and the BBC, among others. And if you frequent C-SPIN, you'll see Professor Foley giving testimony before some committee or other, either in the House or the Senate. So she's well known throughout the country as an expert on constitutional issues. So due to the fact we're pressed for time, I'm not going to read all her credentials. They're numerous and impressive. She has, she graduated from uh, Emory University with a BA. She earned her JD from the University of Tennessee College of Law and has a degree from the Harvard Law School. So let's welcome Professor Foley to FAU. Okay, uh, apologies for being late. Um, we're going to talk uh, today about the constitutionality of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and I wanted to just preface all the discussion by just talking a little bit about what the deal does uh, and you know, what's going on in Iran, just to give you some basic background. Um, making a nuclear bomb, as you probably know, it requires uh, uranium and plutonium, uh, and both have to go into uh, to making of a weapon. They both have to be weapon grade. Um, when it comes to uranium, you have to enrich the uranium with a, a bunch of centrifuges to the spin the uranium and enrich it. Uh, when it comes to the Iran deal, what they've done, for example, uh, is it takes about 90 percent uh, enrichment grade to make a bomb. Uh, be usable for a bomb. This Iran deal is going to take it from, we're not really sure where Iran is right now, somewhere between about 20% enrichment and 90% enrichment is where Iran currently is. Um, so we don't, we're not quite sure if they can make the bomb today. We don't think so. So they're probably somewhere right here. It's going to take them from somewhere here down to 3.7% enrichment, which would be well below uh, uh, weapons grade. So uh, we have that commitment from them. That's part of their commitment as part of the deal. Uh, when it comes to plutonium, one of the things that we're really concerned about is what's called the Iraq uh, reactor. Uh, uh, the Iraq reactor is uh, basically a nuclear reactor that is designed to take uh, uh, uranium and uh, uh, it basically irradiates it in the reactor facility to make it uh, weapons grade. And what we have is a commitment from Iran pursuant to this deal that they're going to take that Iraq uh, a reactor that they currently have and they're going to modify it, literally just physically modify it, so that they can't irradiate uh, the uh, plutonium and have weapon-grade plutonium. Okay, so um, as part of these commitments to sort of ratchet down their uh, nuclear program, we uh, have a system of compliance verification by the IAEA. The IAEA is the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, it's basically a nonprofit entity. It's not a governmental entity. It's a private organization. But as you can see, it has a board of <coughs> governors, board of directors. And uh, on that board, all the ones that I've highlighted in red are the uh, parties to this particular deal with Iran. You can see the United States is there, UK, Russia, France, Germany, and China. So we are on the board of the IAEA, but we don't dominate the board by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you can see some actual text from the uh, agreement with Iran. Uh, they're going to implement what's called a roadmap that they have with the IAEA. That roadmap was agreed to back in July of this summer, uh, and it basically is trying to get 
uh, Iran in compliance with existing United Nations uh, uh, demands over many, many years. Uh, and so this roadmap is sort of Iran and the IAEA's contractual undertaking just amongst those two parties. And the United States has nothing to do with the roadmap. It literally is a contract between Iran and the IAEA where Iran agrees to do certain things to try to come into compliance with prior UN uh, commitments. Um, and then uh, what happens is that there's also this agreement that Iran will allow the IAEA to monitor the implementation not only of that roadmap, but of course of this actual agreement that the United States and the other uh, European uh, countries have entered into. Um, there are um, side deals with the IAEA. Um, that roadmap from July of this summer is one such side deal. As I just explained, the U.S. is not a party to that contractual relationship. There's a separate side deal that we know about that Iran and the IAEA have signed together, uh, which deals with the Parchin facility. Uh, I've got a little uh, satellite image of the Parchin facility there. That's uh, a couple years old, actually. Um, but the Parchin facility is sort of a top secret um, military research facility. We're not really sure what's entirely going on at the Parchin facility, but we think that they're using it for not only the development of the weapons themselves, but they're also testing the weapons at this particular facility just by the satellite imagery changing over a period of time. Um, the problem with trying to figure out what's going on at Parchin is that the uh, Iran has been very reluctant to let anybody near Parchin. Uh, it has very recently, in the last few weeks, allowed the IAEA to enter Parchin, but of course the IAEA inspectors who were there were accompanied every second of, of the visit um, by Iranian <coughs> officials. Uh, the Iranian officials did hand some soil samples uh, to the IAEA inspectors uh, a couple weeks ago that the IAEA could test to see if the soil uh, that was supposedly taken from the Parchin site uh, was contaminated with uh, nuclear materials that would suggest that they have actually been testing uh, a nuclear bomb at that site. But the problem with that is we're not, we can't exactly verify that those soil samples came from Parchin. So they were just, you know, samples that they handed to us uh, when we entered the facility. So Parchin is of, a con of concern, but we don't have any control over it because that agreement is a side agreement that the United States has not signed. Uh, and as with all of these side deals between the IAEA and Iran, uh, because we are not parties to this contractual undertaking, Congress has not seen the text of the side deals. They're considered to be confidential agreements between Iran and the IAEA. We have summaries of those agreements, but we don't have the actual text. Uh, and the President of the United States has not seen uh, that those are side agreements either. Uh, in return for these commitments that Iran is making to ratchet down its uh, nuclear capabilities, the United States is, uh, has its own commitments. Uh, most notably, of course, the um, United States is covenanting to cease the application of sanctions uh, against Iran. Uh, in addition to those uh, particular economic sanctions, you can see we're agreeing to uh, begin the sale of commercial passenger aircraft and related parts and services to Iran. Uh, we're also agreeing to license non-U.S. Uh, persons, i.e. businesses, uh, that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons to engage in activities with Iran, uh, which would basically free uh, not only domestic companies, but foreign entities that are owned by U.S. persons to freely engage in uh, economic uh, trade and other activities with Iran. Um, and we, we're covenanting that we will uh, do what we can uh, to lift all existing sanctions. That's a big if, how much authority does the president have the ability to, to, to lift the sanctions by himself if Congress is not blessing it. We're also uh, covenanting that we're going to encourage the states like Florida uh, to lift their sanctions because it's not just the feds who have sanctions against Iran. Uh, many of the states uh, have their own state law sanctions against Iran and while the federal government may or may not be able to force the states to lift uh, those sanctions as a question of preemption that we won't get into tonight. Uh, at least there, uh, you can see the language is we're going to encourage the states to do so. How that's going to work, nobody exactly knows. Um, the uh, existing statutory sanctions, there's a lot of statutes that have sanctions against Iran. 
Uh, the most recent ones are this bill called this law called SASADA that was uh, signed by President Obama in 2010. Uh, there's even more the recent one called ITRA that was uh, signed by the President in 2012. Uh, because these are statutes, uh, lifting the statutes that this, uh, the sanctions that the statutes contain requires congressional approval, right? Because you can't mess with a statute. The president can't unilaterally amend the statute. If you're going to change the statute, it has to be amended by Congress itself. One of the biggest controversies about this deal is that some people are going around saying it's a treaty, it's a treaty, it's a treaty, uh, and that's why a lot of people uh, are criticizing the president. I would suggest to you if there's one takeaway from tonight, it would be that uh, what is or is not a treaty is far from clear. We do have some basic ideas and some historical understandings of what that is, and I'll walk you through that very quickly. Um, but at the end of the day, whether something is legally a treaty under the Constitution versus an executive agreement um, is probably what's called non-justiciable, which means that the courts wouldn't touch it with a proverbial 50,000 foot pole um, because it is basically a dispute between two political branches uh, for which there are no judicially ascertainable standards. So if the court doesn't feel like it has some objective standard that it could uh, draw the dividing line between the treaty and the executive agreement, it just won't touch the case. Uh, and I think that's probably where we're at. If something is a treaty, though, just as a reminder, uh, you probably remember from your civics class in high school that treaties have to be approved by the Senate by a two-thirds vote of the senators who are present, which basically comes down to 67 senators in a normal situation. Uh, executive agreements, by contrast, uh, you're not going to find these things mentioned in the Constitution, but they have been historically used since the absolute earliest days of the Republic to every president in history has signed some form of executive agreement. Uh, just to give you a sense of numbers, uh, almost 19,000 executive agreements since uh, 1789, the first year that the Constitution was in effect. Uh, and really it's blossomed since uh, 1939, since the FDR uh, days, uh, with the vast bulk of them since then. By contrast, only 1,100 treaties have been ratified by the Senate. So we, we may say, well, what makes a treaty a treaty? Um, if we wanted to at least argue from a principled perspective, if not a um, uh, litigation perspective, that this should be a treaty. If we were a politician, for example, and wanted to go around and tell our constituents this was a treaty, we would probably quote Federalist for, uh, 75, which was written by Alexander Hamilton. You know that the Federalist Papers are one of the best sources for understanding what the founders thought uh, was the meaning of what they were writing. Um, and this particular Federalist paper says that treaties, uh, the, the object of the clause is contracts with foreign nations that, that, that have the force of law and they derive, of course, from the obligations of good faith. They're not rules uh, prescribed by the sovereign to the subject to us, but agreements between sovereign and sovereign. So if you try to break that down, it's basically a contract between sovereigns, right? Anytime two sovereigns want to have some agreement sovereign to sovereign, uh, that would have some force of law within their own domestic sphere, uh, that would technically be called a treaty, at least by Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and the reason why we had that treaty clause, explained Hamilton in Federalist 75, was that we didn't, we didn't want to give one body, and in particular we didn't want to give one person, the party, to, to make these sovereign to sovereign contracts because if one person has that much power, then uh, the wrong person at the wrong time could do a lot of damage to the country very, very quickly. So by uh, call, saying that treaties have to be entered into by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate, uh, we're not just having one man with the power to do it, but he's checked by, of course, the 67 senators who have to give that advice and consent. Um, if you want to look at history and how we have historically viewed what is or is not a treaty, uh, one thing you do see that will jump out at you is that nearly every time we've made a treaty, um, it's been because it falls within one of these categories. It's either sort of a mutual defense compact where the United States agrees to come to the aid of France, for example, uh, in the event that one of us is attacked. Uh, it could be an extradition or a mutual legal assistance type uh, contractual undertaking. Almost all human rights endeavors have been ratified by the Senate as treaties. 
Uh, and then the highlighted one I have there, which I think is the most salient here, is that it, almost always we've taken arms control and reduction matters and made those treaties. Um, so the examples would be the SALT I, SALT II treaties that we uh, entered into in the 70s and 80s, uh, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the Chemical Weapons Convention, all of those are actual treaties that the Senate ratified, and then other things like environmental protection, taxation, and boundary disputes. But you can see that just in that category of arms control and reduction, even though it's not our arms control and reduction, it's Iran's arms control and uh, reduction, uh, there's an argument in the world that this is something that's serious enough that it ought to be given treaty status. Uh, you might also look at some State Department regulations. State, you know, these are just regulations. They don't have the force of the statute. They certainly don't have the force of the Constitution itself. This is just the State Department talking to its own people about when its own diplomats and negotiators should call something a treaty versus an executive agreement. And they got all these little factors in their regulations. You can see that they, they say the extent to which there's a risk that could affect the nation as a whole. If there is a high risk, that suggests it should be a treaty. Uh, whether the agreement is intended to affect state laws, if it is intended to affect state laws, that suggests it should be a treaty. Um, whether the agreement can be given effect without the enactment of legislation by Congress. Clearly, if it's something Congress needs to authorize in order to execute and make work, that would suggest that you need to uh, uh, give it treaty status. Past U.S. practice is important, as we just talked about. The preference of Congress itself as to what kind of agreement it wants it to be is important. The degree of formality of the agreement itself, the duration, the need for prompt conclusion, general international practice, all of that. And then you can see the uh, concluding paragraph is in determining whether any international agreement should be brought into force as a treaty or an international agreement other than a treaty. The utmost care is to be exercised to avoid any invasion or compromise of the constitutional powers of the President, the Senate, and the Congress as a whole. Uh, so that's a suggestion that you need to tread lightly here. And that also suggests that if there's a doubt, we should probably presume treaty status because that's the least invasive of the legislative branch's prerogatives. Um, when we do enter into executive agreements, we have two types that we've historically had. The Congressional Executive Agreement, which as the name suggests, is when uh, Congress passes its, an ordinary statute, right, an ordinary law. And as an ordinary law, it requires a simple majority of both houses to pass, uh, as opposed to a treaty, which again requires two-thirds of the Senate only. Uh, so if a, a Congressional Executive Agreement is basically just a statute, just a regular law. Uh, and then there's these things called sole executive agreements. These puppies are really, really rare, okay, because what they basically are is the president is asked, is claiming that he's got, he has his own independent authority under Article II of the Constitution, which is the article that gives the president his power, uh, and that he's relying solely on his power and not Congress's power uh, to sign the executive agreement. And because uh, the president's Article II power uh, over foreign affairs as a general matter is generally thought to be shared with Congress uh, and not something the President has uh, alone. Uh, we, we don't have any sole executive agreement, much less a sense of when they're constitutional or not. Um, but if you wanted some guidance on uh, how a court would assess it should the court ever be asked is this a treaty or is this uh, an executive agreement? You'd look to a case called Youngstown. Uh, it's like the big case uh, in ascertaining the constitutionality of presidential power. Okay, um, it's called the Steel Seizure case because it was from the Korean War era in the 1950s, and President Truman had uh, seized the domestic steel mills in the United States, and he did it. He grabbed the mills because he said we need your steel to make munitions for the war effort, uh, and we're afraid there's going to be a strike. Uh, and the owners of the mill brought a lawsuit against the president saying you don't have the constitutional authority to do that. Uh, the court agreed with the, the mill owners, uh, said that President Truman was behaving unconstitutionally uh, because the power to seize something, to take something, is a legislative power. Think about the takings clause and how if uh, we're going to take private property for public use, we have to pay just compensation. That's something that Congress decides. And of course, Congress had not authorized President Truman's seizure. So it was unconstitutional. 
But the reason why the case is important for analyzing the constitutionality of presidential action is actually coming from Justice Jackson's concurrence in the case. He laid out what they call a tripartite framework uh, where the court will just figure out which of these three boxes the case falls into, and that should give the court its mindset or the presumption of starting the analysis of the case. So you can see that category one of uh, Youngstown is the court said, well, when a president acts pursuant to congressional authorization, either explicit congressional authorization or implicit congressional authorization, the president is acting at his highest ebb of authority. That when he does that, it's presumptively constitutional because it's basically a big kumbaya hug with Congress, right? You have our two political branches of government, the president and the Congress, agreeing with each other. If you were a court, would you second guess that? Right? That, that's a moment where you really want to back off as a court and say, these two, guys, these two political branches who are politically accountable to the people in the way that I'm not as a court are in agreement. Why on earth should I second guess that? And then you've got this thing called the twilight zone, um, where the president is taking an action. <coughs> Congress has been absolutely silent on the issue. It's like total crickets from Congress. If that's the case, then frankly, we have no guidance. We have no guidance from Youngstown. We have no guidance from <coughs> And so if you're a litigator, you try to avoid the zone like the plague, uh, and you try to argue for zones one or three. Uh, and then the third one is when the president is acting in a way where it's clear to the court that he's acting contrary to the wishes of Congress. If Congress says X and the president says not X, if they're in total disagreement on something, then at that point, says Youngstown, Youngstown the president's power is at his lowest end, and it's presumptively unconstitutional for the president to act. So in this category down here, courts are incredibly scrutinizing. They will not get out a rubber stamp and approve what the president is doing. They will take a very hard look at what he's doing, and what he's doing will probably be ruled unconstitutional. Well, and then you say, well, what, has Congress approved or not, right, of what uh, President Obama is doing with the Iran deal? Because that would help you figure out which box you're in in Youngstown. We have this law, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it, it's called Corker Carbon. Uh, it is a law It was passed by both houses of Congress uh, this summer. You can see by overwhelming majorities, uh, and of course signed by the president. And then what it does is it gives Congress 60 days to review the agreement. Right? The president has to give the agreement to Congress, and then once he does that, a 60-day clock begins ticking. And during that 60 days, they can approve or disapprove, or do nothing. If they do nothing, it's deemed approved under Corker Carter, okay? If they disapprove, then what he has to do, he can veto their disapproval, and then once he, because he would, because it's his deal and he wants it, um, once he vetoes their disapproval, then it goes back to Congress, and the only way Congress can override his veto is in the traditional way, which is by two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress. So basically what this is doing is under Corker Cardin, it's taking two-thirds of both houses of Congress to stop the Iran deal, right? As opposed to the uh, treaty where it would have to be an affirmative blessing by two-thirds of the Senate to approve the treaty. So it's kind of turning things on its head. And here's the deal with Corker Cardin. We passed Corker Cardin. We have the 60-day time clock because the president, I think, submitted the agreement on like July 20th. The 60-day time clock has already expired, right? If you do the math, it's like September or something uh, when it expired. And technically, Congress has never voted to approve or disapprove the Iran deal, right? We have the House, who very aggressively voted uh, just a, a few weeks ago on 9-11, uh, ironically enough, uh, to reject the Iran deal. So pursuant to Corker Cardin, the House is on record as opposing the Iran deal, right? And then it, it was supposed to go to the Senate but the problem was that the president was afraid that under Youngstown, if the Senate rejected the Iran deal too, just like the House did, that that would suggest to the court that we were in Youngstown Category 3, where Congress was expressing disapproval of the Iran deal, Iran deal, and we would have that presumption of unconstitutionality of the president's action. So rather than facing a Senate defeat, uh, what happened was that the Democrats in the Senate uh, threatened the filibuster. 
And uh, what happens when you threaten a filibuster is that once someone starts a filibuster, to stop the filibuster, you have to have what's called a cloture vote. And a cloture vote requires 60 votes, right? To stop the filibuster, you've got to have a supermajority, you've got to have 60 votes. So if 40 senators won't support cloture, we can never have a vote taking place in the Senate. That's just the crazy rules of the Senate. You don't have the filibuster in the House. So uh, Obama got on the phone and he secured 42 Democratic senators out of existing 46 uh, to refuse uh, cloture. So what we have right now is that the Senate has not voted on court McCarthy, which means it has not taken any vote, yay or nay, on the Iran deal. Uh, and we don't know <coughs> officially how the Senate feels. So since the Senate can't get to a vote due to this filibuster threat, um, we, we're not really sure where we are should the constitutionality of the Iran deal be challenged in court because we don't know which Youngstown category uh, we're in. If the Senate had officially gone on record against the Iran deal, uh, then we would again potentially be in Youngstown category three because the President would be acting without approval of either the House or the Senate. But since we haven't voted at all, uh, the corker Cardin law has deemed this uh, Iran deal to be approved. So the, the question is, is it approved or disapproved? corker Cardin says, if Congress doesn't act, it's deemed approved. But technically, we have a situation where the House has disapproved. And the Senate has not taken a vote because presumably a majority of the senators would have disapproved had they had the opportunity to vote. So from a legal perspective, if you're a judge, you say to yourself, well, should I take that state of the evidence as existence of congressional approval of the Iran deal? Because that's the way Carter Cardin technically set it up. Or should I take that as evidence of congressional disapproval? Nobody knows the answer to that. The other big question here, too, is, is there actually a moment when Corker Cardin's 60-day period was triggered? In other words, was the agreement right, that Corker Cardin specifies actually transmitted to Congress? Because it's only once that agreement gets transmitted to Congress that the 60-day clock starts ticking. And if you look at Corker Cardin itself, it does define what is an agreement. And it basically says the agreement uh, and all related materials means the agreement itself and any additional materials related thereto, including annexes, appendices, consul, side agreements, implementing materials, documents, guidance, technical, blah, 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 everything, including the side agreement. And the argument now is being made by some in Congress that the Obama administration has not provided the agreement to Congress at all, and therefore Corker Cardin is still kind of in the ether and the 60-day clock has not even begun because the President has not transmitted the side agreements between the IAEA and Iran. And so if that's the case, then we may be in a totally different legal posture um, because the President uh, is not authorized under Corker Cardin to waive any existing statutory sanctions until he has submitted the agreement and Congress has had a 60-day review period. If he hasn't yet submitted the agreement and Congress hasn't yet triggered, it hasn't triggered the 60-day congressional review period, then the President, under Corker Cardin, is not authorized by Congress to waive any sanctions at all with Iran. So you can see that that would be legally problematic for the President should this thing end up in court. Now, President Obama's position uh, is a logical one. He says, look, we can't transmit the side agreements between the IAEA and Iran because we don't have copies of them ourselves, right? We can't give you what we don't have. And so the administration is taking the position that it has complied with Corker Cardin, that it has transmitted the agreement, uh, and since Congress has not disapproved for the uh, Iran agreement within the relevant 60-day period, the deal should be deemed disapproved uh, under Corker Cardin. But so the legal question, should this thing ever get litigated, is Corker Cardin an unconstitutional usurpation of the, tr uh, the treaty power of the Senate? Uh, I think the answer to this one is no. Uh, 
Uh, not because it shouldn't be a treaty. Uh, arguably, it should be a treaty based on historical practice, uh, especially because it deals with arms control uh, and national security issues. Um, but the, the question is not really that on a philosophical level. It is, would a court ever wade into that question? If you were a judge, again, would you want to try to draw the line between a treaty and an executive agreement? It'd be exceedingly hard to write an opinion that says exactly when you cross over some magical line from treaty land into executive agreement land, uh, it would be a sticky undertaking by a court. And I'm not sure they would have any real objective standards by which to determine when that line uh, has been crossed. So I don't think uh, this one's going to get uh, uh, ever a decision by court, not only in my lifetime, but in you know, my great-great-grandkids' lifetimes. I just don't think this is uh, a question that courts will ever resolve for us. They're going to leave it to the political branches. But assuming that's right, we still have these other legal questions, right? Has Congress approved or disapproved of the Iran deal? We talked about that. We don't know which category it would fall under, under Youngstown. And has the corporate carbon agreement even itself been complied with? If somebody wanted to challenge that in court, uh, what would the court say? Here's the big practical problem. Who has standing to raise any of this stuff, right? Who would be able to walk into a court and get the court to address the merits of these legal questions. There is a doctrine called standing, which is really important to courts. And what they basically say is that if you want to be a plaintiff and go into a court, you have to have what's called a concrete, particularized, personal injury that you've suffered. Right? And uh, one of the things you cannot have, the court has absolutely slammed the door on, is generalized taxpayer or citizen standing. So if you and I think the president is doing something unconstitutional or Congress is doing something unconstitutional, we can't just go into a court and file a lawsuit and get the court to give us a ruling on the constitutional issue. The court will, it will demand that if you do walk into court, they're going to say, okay, tell me exactly how you personally have been harmed by this. So think about it, the Iran deal. Let's say you, you really believe in your heart of hearts that oh, I bet you that, that this is that this is a this is a treaty, right? And this is not a conjectural argument. Um, there's a, a organization, a nonprofit organization called Freedom Watch. Some of you may have heard of it. They litigate a lot of cases in court involving constitutional issues. A guy named Larry Clayman is the head of it, and uh, they've actually filed a suit here in the Federal District Court for the Southern District of Florida, uh, pending down the street. Uh, where they basically are challenging corporate pardon as a violation of the treaty clause, right? Because it's a congressional executive agreement. They say it shouldn't be a congressional executive agreement. It should be treated as a treaty. And my prediction, of course, as you can see, is that it's going to be dismissed for want of standing. Because think about it. Freedom Watch, Larry Clayman, who's the head of Freedom Watch. How's he been harmed by this? Even if he's right that it should be a treaty, How's he personally harmed by the fact that Congress has chosen to treat it as an executive agreement rather than a treaty? I mean, because think how you have to set up this argument. It's like, if it's a treaty, two-thirds of, of the Senate have to approve, whereas if it's a congressional executive agreement, the majority of both houses of Congress have to approve. How are you harmed by one political method over another political method? It's very hard to show that you personally, in some concrete way, have been harmed by that. It sounds like generalized taxpayer standing, and that's simply not allowed. So I think that's going to go away. The more interesting question, and unpredictable one, is can Congress sue? Because think about it. If anybody really has been harmed by it, it's not me and you, because we don't have that particularized harm personally to us from this other than a general belief that the Constitution isn't being abided by, but that never gives standing. So who has been suffered particularized harm? Arguably, it's Congress, right? Because Congress itself has its own institutional interests. And in particular, what part of Congress do you think is harmed here, or could make an argument that they've been harmed? Yeah, it's the Senate. And it's the Senate because they're the ones who have the authority under the Treaty Clause to approve it by two-thirds. 
and by entering into an executive agreement instead, it certainly watered down the Senate's authority. It's raised the House's authority by getting the House involved, whereas otherwise they wouldn't be. Um, but it has watered down the Senate's role. So it's possible that senators could get together as an institution and sue. I think in order to convince the court that they're speaking for the institution, you'd have to have a majority of the senators actually join in the lawsuit. So you'd have to have 51 senators join in that lawsuit. Uh, a little rump group of senators won't suffice, I don't think, because I don't think you can say to the court they speak for the Senate, qua Senate. Um, but um, my guess is there's not 51 to do that, and so this hypothetical lawsuit that I'm throwing out to you will simply never happen. And that's, that's it. I've breezed through it as fast as I could. And I'm, uh, okay, so as you were talking, I got a news alert in an article that just came out. Oh, that, uh, just now? Like this, it just hit the press? Yeah, about a day ago, or two okay. days ago rather, that apparently under the Iran Threat Reduction Act, there's specific requirements that the president cannot lift sanctions unless two things happen. One, Iran's taken off the state-sponsored terrorism list, and two, they quit their quest for weapons of mass destruction. Now, the Iranians yesterday tested a ballistic missile that could yes. carry a nuclear warhead. Yes. So they've already violated the agreement. They've already violated it. <laughs> right. So even if the president attempts to do that, you would be in violation of federal law to put it in an impeachment status if I'm not mistaken. Well, you know, impeachment is a political question, right? Uh, so whether we have the political willpower to impeach, I, I think it's pretty clear that we don't. Uh, so let me just get well, on Obviously we don't have that, but I'm just saying that puts in, in a... Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly is going to cause people to start talking about impeachment, but just this cry for impeachment I don't think will take us any further than previous cries for impeachment. Um, and uh, that's coming from Senator Cruz, because I was just speaking to someone in Senator Cruz's office about that exact issue a few days ago. Um, and and the, the concern with that is that he's basically, I mean, I love Senator Cruz, he's a very nice guy, but he's using that for I bet that he's crazy. But no, no, I mean, he's a very intelligent guy, he went to Harvard Law School, he's a brilliant lawyer, frankly, but um, uh, he's using it for political purposes because he's running for president. Uh, I'm just going to be pragmatic about that. Um, and he knows, and his staff knows, that no one has standing to raise that issue. So if nobody has standing to raise the issue, you can go around and talk to the press all you want about this violation, this violation, this violation of law, just like whether the agreement has been transmitted to Congress is a violation of law. But if nobody has the ability to go into a court and have a neutral court say that it's a violation of law, then it's just talk. It's just political talk. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question about the Young Yeah. Um, did Young Sun create a tripartite framework that applies to all executive agreements or simply to those that? It's not even executive agreements. It's a tripartite framework for the ascertainment of whether or not the president's actions, whatever they are, are constitutional. And it applies to all presidential actions or just a certain category? It only applies, well, in this particular area, it is most often used for exercises where the president is claiming that he has some foreign affairs authority. Under okay. Article Two, some independent authority of his own. Okay, and then just to follow up to that, please. Um, has it been applied elsewhere? Um, it it has been used outside the foreign affairs context in a limited sense, and the reason I say that it's used in a limited sense is because usually when it is another context outside foreign affairs, there's another line of jurisprudence that's more apt that the court will tap into than the other now. But it has been used in foreign affairs and other foreign affairs issues? Yes, yes. It's been used outside of foreign affairs. So it is a question, really what Youngstown is, is not about foreign affairs per se, even though the facts of that case involve foreign affairs. Youngstown is an analytical framework for right. determining whether the president is acting constitutionally simplicity. Right. I was just wondering full, about the intent of it stop. originally was about that one case, right. so I was wondering about how that intent carried forward into other cases and whether or not it has been tested. Yeah, that it's no, been used and challenged. It absolutely has been applied. Uh, example of uh, President Obama's recent uh, actions involving immigration. Okay. Uh, he's it had uh, executive orders, not agreements, but executive orders uh, that have um, basically uh, defined categories of individuals mm -hmm. who are not deportable, uh, like the DREAM Act individuals. Um, Congress has not authorized that. Congress considered the DREAM Act, did not pass it. 
Uh, the president, nonetheless, by executive action, uh, basically unilaterally enacted the DREAM Act. Uh, clearly, that's not a foreign affairs issue. That's a domestic immigration law issue. Um, that got challenged in court by the state of Texas. So there's a lawsuit pending in Texas right now challenging the constitutionality of uh, the president's uh, executive orders on immigration. And one of the things that happened is that in all the briefs in, the, in those cases, um, the government and the, the challengers, uh, Texas et al, it's not just Texas, it's 26 states total, um, used Youngstown. Right? And they said, look, this has to be a Youngstown Category 3 case, said Texas and the other states, because Congress thought about the DREAM Act, debated the DREAM Act extensively, and said no to it, and yet the president did it anyway. So he's in direct defiance of Congress. Yes. Uh, one other thing that uh, came to mind. Yeah. Um, let's just say, for sake of argument, which okay. I'm under the opinion that this is going to happen anyway, we're under a defense treaty with Israel at the moment. Yep. If Israel goes ahead and strikes the Iranian nuclear facilities Woo! because they feel that they're under threat, from what I understand, there's a provision of the agreement with Iran that says we have to defend them should the Israelis decide to take action. So I'm a little confused. One would be violating the existing defense treaty with another country if that said country felt threatened and had to attack. And you just don't know a little bit of an explanation about maybe the constitutionality of yeah. another treaty being violated. Here's the problem. I do not, I have not seen that language in the agreement itself. I've read the agreement itself pretty carefully. The problem is it's not the agreement, but it's also the appendices, the codicils, um, all kinds of, tons of annexes. Um, and I haven't gone through those with a fine tooth comb. Um, I don't think what you're, uh, here's my hunch. You're not gonna find a direct statement like that that you just made, that should Israel attack Iran, that the United States is affirmatively obligated to defend Iran. Uh, what you'll probably find is more wishy-washy language that basically the United States agrees to cooperate with Iran uh, in ensuring its security. So for example, um, there is a provision in the main agreement that talks about how since we are acknowledging that Iran can legitimately have uh, um, nuclear capability for peaceful purposes, that we covenant in the agreement to um, help Iran understand how to best manage peaceful nuclear capability. And in best managing that peaceful nuclear capability, one of the things that is mentioned very briefly is that we agree to help Iran figure out how to sort of secure its peaceful nuclear facilities. Um, I think that's as close as you're going to get to an affirmative statement that we defend Iran. There, I'm, I'm positive we weren't stupid enough to put a provision in there that said, if Iran is attacked by Israel, we will come to the aid of Iran. If that had really been there, it would have been quoted directly in all the newspapers by now. Newspapers are bad, but they're not that bad. <laughs> that would have been, that should have been a, a headline. It should have been a front page news story. If not on the New York Times, which may have buried it, you know, eight pages in, it would have been on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I mean, uh, the editors of the Wall Street Journal would have noted it. On the, um, all right, so on the Carbon, uh, Carbon, 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 you can say Carbon, The, um, who would have to, you're saying use the Senate. My question is, is not the president direct action to prevent a vote a case for nullifying the idea that Congress did not act? If he's the one who has the direct action to prevent. Well, he, he didn't prevent it. It's that the Democrats in the Senate decided to threaten the Philippines. Who is action. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he certainly, I know, they're right. of the same political party, so of course they're not going to disagree with you. So, I mean, would that be the available wedge to try and, to try and destroy the, the, the uh, not credibility, what's the word I'm looking the... Who are we trying to destroy? Court, court. Oh, the, the act itself? Yeah. Well, the problem is that the act itself has already been enacted. Mm -hmm. It's been signed by the president, so it's a valid law. The only question is, the only real legal questions are, 
A, should it have been done as a, as a treaty rather than an executive right. agreement? We think that that's non-justiciable, that no right. court's going to touch that one, so we'll put that aside. Um, the other questions are, has the 60-day time clock even begun ticking? Um, again, that's a fascinating question. I think there's good arguments that it hasn't begun ticking because they haven't submitted the side deals. But I'm, I'm hard-pressed to figure out who has standing to sue over that. And uh, the same issue with uh, some of these other treaties, like ITRA. Um, I, I just can't wrap my mind around, uh, as a relatively creative lawyer, um, who would have standing to, to raise these issues. So this, the, the, the agreement itself will have statute level uh, no. legal thing, or not statute level? <laughs> Well, right now, um, Corker Cardin simply on its face gives Congress a certain number of days to say yay or nay. Let's if say, if, those, if the 60-day time clock has begun ticking mm -hmm. and has already expired, right, because right, that would have been sometime in mid-September, then under Corker Cardin, which has the force of a statute, it is a statute, then pursuant to that statute, Congress's silence or indecision has the legal effect of meaning that it's blessing the president to go forward. Okay, but what I'm, what I'm, my specific idea is, is that the agreement itself yeah. would be an executive agreement. Uh, or will it be it's a statute a, level because of... It's an order. executive agreement that is has been entered into not as a sole executive agreement, but a congressional agreement. So, what he was talking about with the president doing actions when they have already violated those are direct would be considered a direct violation of law. If he continued to do hold up our end what they've already violated. Oh well see that's another question because the problem with the agreement itself mm -hmm. is that there there are snapback provisions. So if the president makes certain findings, he can snap back the sanctions pretty quickly. The, the problem is that I don't think the president is going to do that. Right. And it's the Corker Cardin gives it completely to the discretion of yeah, the president. That's, that's, that's what I was trying to find out. Is, so it won't be a violation of law. He'll be, he has discretion. He has the discretion to do it. Congress, the president does have obligations under Corker Cardin to report to Congress when cert, on certain moments, when certain things happen. And so if Congress got a report, Right, that basically said, that suggested to Congress that it has already been violated by Iran, then presumably Congress could pass another statute overriding or changing Corker Cardin, which itself is just a. <laughs> and remember, all of this means that the, this president, um, a future president, can recede from this agreement if he wants to. It may be difficult to do because this agreement has been blessed by the UN Security Council. Uh, and so for the United States now, to, if they ever wanted in the future to recede from uh, this agreement, um, would basically be you know, sort of giving the middle finger to the rest of the Security Council, um, <laughs> or some people on the Security Council, because not everybody on the Security Council would probably agree with the United States. Uh, and therefore the United States would look like we're the ones now who are in defiance of international law. And we're going against the international community. So we can, our president can do it. Our president is not bound by the UN. He doesn't answer to the UN or anything like that. He can always recede if he thinks it's politically or in the national security interest of the United States to do so. But there will be a political price to pay with the international community. Let me ask one more one, uh, final question. What about would the states have standing uh, insofar as the sanctions are lifted and sanctions contrary to state law and policy? Yeah, the, we're trying to ascertain uh, an argument right now as to how the states would be harmed. That's harder than it seems because the uh, Obama administration has actually sort of treaded with a light foot here, and it has suggested that it is not going to be aggressive in requiring states to change their existing sanctions laws, therefore kind of leaving it to the discretion of the states to figure out whether, so in other words, the Obama administration is not taking an aggressive, we're going to go into court and say that your state laws are preempted mode. Uh, and absent the Obama administration doing that, the states don't have the injury in fact to establish that. So I think that's going to get punted too. I don't think that that's going to result in litigation. Okay, thank you, Professor okay. Foley. Yeah. Great questions, I hope you all get a law school. <laughs> actually, I'd love actually, to have a lot of you in class.
class. I do five to five, including FIU next week. Okay, give me your name and then I'm going to